record on this computer. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, July 24th, 2022. I'm Larry Rhodes or Doubter 5. And as usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Every day, every week, every hour, here I am on the Wombat. Nice to meet you guys. Every <laughs> hour, wow. <laughs> and our guests today are Dread Pirate Higgs. Welcome. Hoy. And uh, from Texas, Sky, welcome. Good morning. The Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faith, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. In Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. We'll tell you more about that after mid-show break. Um, Ty, what's our topic for today? We're talking about two things. We're talking about devils in the details and also a little thing called uh, Jesus measurement units, which we're going to get into as well. But, uh, you know, that's what I like to consider the main course. How about we start with a little bit of carbs? to start our morning and we'll throw it up to Rowan Dread Pirate Higgs for a weekly invocation. Arr! Oh monster, grant me the serenity to know the things I cannot change, the strength to know the things I can, and the noodle to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Ramen. 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 That's one of my favorite ones. It, we don't hear that one very often, but I think it's uh -uh. very <laughs> Give me the ability. So, you know, I, I, I grew up on a show called Conan the Barbarian, or it was really a movie. And it was a comic book before it was a movie. And yeah. the cool thing about the comic is the guy was so metal in the sense that there was a there was a there's a story where he went to go try to fight this big monster boss. But before that, he went to like this creature that would grant him any wish. Right. Mm -hmm. And when he was able to get the wish the only thing he asked for before he was about to go through his epic battle was i just want a fighting chance don't make me any stronger don't give me a super <laughs> weapon just give me a fighting chance and i'll take care of it from there and i'm like that is so respectful in the same way we got to use your noodle you got to have a fighting chance against the waves of ignorance that are coming at you yeah. so don't forget yeah. you got a cool thing up here and and you have all the capability to improve it uh, before we go on our topic today, let's do a round table. How's everybody doing today? Dread, looking sharp, looking clean. How you been? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. I uh, I performed two weddings yesterday. Ooh, congratulations! Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, two. So, what's one that? Day. I said two in one day. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, is I he had... counting the groom and the bride? Because every wedding. <laughs> yeah, no, I had one in the morning, uh, which was really just to cover off on the legal aspect of it and then um the second one was uh um in the afternoon out at a river bank and wow. it was a full out uh hand fasting ceremony and hand um fasting. what does that mean they they you know they asked me to uh wear my holy tricorn and my pirate attire and uh yeah it was it was great it was a really good uh, really good ceremony i really enjoyed it is the second one always easier than the first one? Is the first one you just like warm up, you're trying out the new material, and then the second one you're like, okay, I know what swings, I know what bangs, let's go. Yeah, well, see, as a marriage commissioner, I have a standard script that I would generally read from. Mm -hmm. So it's up to uh, up to the uh, celebrants, like the uh, the, the uh, couple, to determine what they want to do because there are there's four statements that uh, are required under law. And that is uh, to um, to have them declare that there's no lawful impediment why they should not be married. <coughs> and then the second statement is uh, to ask those present to witness that they're making a declaration uh, to enter wedlock. That's so, interesting. In, yeah. in, in U.S., Larry, you can maybe educate me. As far as I'm aware, you can do whatever you want on a yeah. wedding, say whatever you want. It's the Pretty certificate much. that makes it legal. The wedding is just a party. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that the, yeah. isn't it not like that in Canada? No. Interesting. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you could actually just marry people without them realizing and being like, hey, this guy's seeing you guys being married and there's no reason for you not to be married. Congratulations. <laughs> well, Bye. I'm going to go yeah, buy yeah, no, have have a license. Now. Now. Yeah, no, the license, the license ties in with the, the de declarations and that's okay. And those okay. two things together is what makes it, <laughs> what makes it legal. 
I'm going to ask one last question. Is there I can't marry thing? people in their sleep. <laughs> <laughs> is there a marriage uh, commissioner license that exists? Yes. Yeah, so is that so I, photo ID? I have an appointment from, yep, I do. And actually, I'm wearing my tricorn in it. Nice. Um, no, I, uh, I'm appointed by the Ministry of uh, Vital Statistics for a 10-year period to perform uh, marriages. Cool. Larry? Uh, you know, I was just going to say that the first marriage that I had, uh, I, had, I checked their IDs and married them right there at, at a table in uh, uh, Barley's Taproom Pizzeria. In, in the you married city. people. Nice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a celebrant for the Rationalists of East Tennessee. And I was also been ordained by the Church of Spiritual something. I can't remember the last Universal, Universal Life Church? I'm no, Universal Life Church. Because no. I'm, I'm ordained with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more although they're, with although with they're not recognized in Canada officially. I, I'm, I'm still a little baffled. I thought, I, so the only thing in the U.S. that matters is the certificate, right? That legal certificate, right? Well, you've got to have the ID to verify who they are, and you've uh -huh. got to get that, get their consent, and usually that's done during the proceedings. Okay, but okay. That, as long as you got a license and they're both signed off on it, that's that's pretty much it. you got to file it, though. If you never file it, you after, gotta file the, it. after the wedding... Uh, if you don't file it, uh, then it's kind of questionable whether you have a, a valid marriage or not. So most people file. <laughs> Good. I feel like only these rules exist because it was just one crazy commissioner out there who was like, and you're married, and now you're married, and he's just yeah. driving the bus. It's like you, or you, some you, ship you, captain. You. <laughs> ship captain. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Larry, chat, catching up with you. How you been? Looking good in those suspenders. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's a fashion statement. No, nice. <laughs> they're very utilitarian. Can you give us a snap before you before you go into your oh, school about you guys do the red cycle? green thing. My southern lawyer. Yeah. Lawyer. No. We need to get you one red strap, one green strap. Yeah. I don't know about that. What did Captain Kangaroo wear? Oh, geez, that's oh, a was, yeah. That's Red Green show. It's a Canadian show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I grew up on Red Green Dread. I'll, I won't leave you out there. I respect that show. They don't find you, find you handsome. handsome. They might as well find, you, don't find handy. you handy. Let's go. Let's go. Anyway, Larry, how you been? How you been? Oh, fine. I'm not riding my motorcycle. It's just too hot. Um, yeah. <clears throat> other than that, I'm uh, just planning on my Quest 2 and working. Nice. But I'm you really keep, enjoying my Quest 2. You keep your stick on the ice. What else can yeah. I tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's Joe Sky, looking good, looking like a fashion statement's ready to happen. How you been? Yeah, I've been good. I've been really busy. Uh, I've been trying to work, uh, do an article a day so I can get ahead on my blog. Nice, nice, cool. very cool. I had a crazy flat tire that happened to me two days ago, and I'm so happy it happened to me because I was wanting to change my tires anyway. And I was looking for every excuse not to go and change my tires. So when I finally got the flat tire, I was like, oh, well, if I went and immediately got my tires changed and then this happened, I would have been very upset. But the <laughs> fact that it like happened when my car was already in a dilapidated state of four wheels, I was just like, fantastic. Now I can time. clean the whole It's system. officially time. Yes, it was It was a, it was a, a sign of God to be like, hey, you change your tires. <laughs> and me being like, no, not yet. I will be the commander of my own fate. And I found a, I finally found a time that worked out well. Oh, really good tire swap, swap and switch. Um, the whole premise was, you know, we have these things in our phones or actually our phones are tied to the database of all human knowledge and stuff like that. So if there's anything you don't know, just Google it there on the spot. You'll find YouTube videos on how to do everything. But yep. thankfully, I already know how to change my tires. But if I, but the first time I did it, I didn't know how to do it. And I had my phone on me. And so what I like is that it's a very detailed process and much things are covered in very fine detail. And I love details because I'm a science, I'm a detailed kind of guy. And the strangest thing that I'm realizing is this phrase that I've heard often is that the devil is in the details. And I ask myself, why is that the case? And so there I am with a flat tire. I'm in the middle of a town that I've not been to. I don't have any way to walk anywhere. And I could pray to get the problem solved. I could be like, God, just fix this problem for me. Or I can go to my trunk, my car, pull out my, you know, my, you know, efficient car jack, get out my spare tire, get out my torque wrench, uh, and then, you know, properly remove all the bolts, put on the temp, 
inflate it back up again because I have my emergency inflator because I'm prepared for any sort of emergency that happens while I'm on the road because I've packed myself accordingly. And I go through all the steps and the, and the sequence that they need to be. I put chocks in the front and the back of my car. As I put my car up on a jack, I have a jack stand ready to support the weight of the car. I got all the details of that procedure down. And that's been so helpful to me. And I didn't see the devil once <laughs> in that whole procedure. But I did realize that there was also a lack of God in that procedure as well. I didn't need to rely on God to help myself get my car tire fixed. And I think that's the concept behind the devil in the detail. There's a concept in religion or the atheist called religion called God of the gaps, where it's, if there's something that you don't know, God exists there. He's taking care of it. And the more, you know, the smaller that gap gets, which means God of the gaps is getting smaller and smaller as our awareness of how the world works also gets smaller. And I think there's a point to be made that there's a fear of nuance from religious sectors because nuance, as we begin to understand it, or as we begin to better understand the, mechan the mechanics of things, will directly imply that there is no God that's in control of, like, say, how cars get fixed or why we get sick or why our climate is changing or how to better interact with people. Like, there's no God there. It's just us. And it's not so much a deep devil aspect. It's the fact that we can take care of ourselves. We can provide the mechanics of our own success and our own failures. And it's up to us to be accountable for our actions. Larry, I want to throw a question out at you. Right. Uh, do you think, do you think, do you think that there is in fact fear from Christianity or any other major religion about uh, scientists trying to like figure out nuance things and what's the fight against uh intellectualism about from religious areas if, if i can oh, make God. the question even more straightforward like why is it the fact why is there a concentrated effort seemingly from religious sectors to not make sure that we are capable of proper scientific modeling of the universe so that we can figure out how to solve these problems that we've been facing like why what's the <coughs> argument there I think the main problem just comes from the fact that when science does come up with explanation, a lot of times it doesn't line up with their scriptures. Boom, there it so, is. So, so you know, they they had take issue with it and say it's not right and it's wrong. We ought to go with our our spirit and our feelings and our heart, mm -hmm. you know, and because it, it doesn't go along with the perceived or I mean the uh, viewed reality that we uh, we experience. I dig it. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Dread, do yes. you have a comment? Go for it. Yeah, <clears throat> there's also uh, the this idea that uh, they try to diminish uh, scientific explanations uh, through arguments like uh, irreducible complexity. Yep. Like, you know, look at the trees, look at an eyeball. You know, how are these these things are irreducibly uh, complex, and and uh, you know, you can't have something that's uh, half an eyeball, half yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah, an eyeball is an eyeball, and there's no precursor to it um, because it wouldn't function as an eyeball. And of course, no, we know that's that not are. true. It's, right. it's just that's an argument from ignorance, really. Right. It's an argument from ignorance. It's one that really badly muddles the water, and it's also one that I find to be dishonest because there are scientific disingenuous, terms. right? Disingenuous, yeah. Disingenuous. Thank you, thank you, because there are Christians who know biology who are aware of what evolution is, who understand that it's a very simple model that explains a lot of things, but choose, you know, just through their environment or not to upset anyone to continue to perpetrate the, the idea that, oh, okay, well, you know, if I'm paid or if, I'm, if my career or my social, you know, group depends on yes. me saying these certain things, I'm not going to go against <clears throat> it. I feel like that, that's both disingenuous and actually harmful. I feel like yep. that's actually right. harmful. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, just as an example, my, my daughter is uh, quite, quite religious. Mm. And she's taking advantage, of course, now of uh, the recent James Webb Space Telescope images mm. to sort of promote the idea that, again, this irreducible complexity and look at the universe, how could it be so complex and, and not have an intelligent designer? Um, again, it's a, a God of the gaps, as you say, God of the gaps argument, but then also a, an argument from ignorance. And uh, um, I don't even communicate with her anymore because, uh, well, and this is actually her thing because uh, she wrote me off as being too skeptical. Uh, and uh, yeah, so anyway, 
she's content to believe in these uh, these these ideas um, at the expense of her familial relationships that uh, wanna, challenge those things. I want to make a point on this, like the idea of being too skeptical. Is it actually maybe there's a devil in the detail? Do you think it is possible for anybody to be too skeptical? And you know, in my I, sense, I, go for it, Dred. What do you think? Well, I mean. It would be, depend on a person's uh, definition of skeptical, right? Right. Because some some people may just seem, or or may feel that you're just uh, you're just being a contrarian. Contrarian, right? Right. And yeah. uh, and that's a, an important distinction between mm. being skeptical of things that deserve skepticism and right. just being contrarian. Because if you're just being if you're just trying to pick fights all the time, well. Uh, yeah, you're not going to make any friends, but, uh, you know, it, that's distinguished from skeptic, healthy scientific skepticism, I would say. So I will Something that uh, Dr. Steve Novella makes a good point of in Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So change doesn't happen without a challenge. That's, that's the, the mantra that I've been following for a while. And well, the cool thing about it is it applies to skepticism as well to the point where it gives skepticism a bad rap because the, the skeptic in the, the layman term is someone who's always challenging things because they don't, don't take anything at face value and they're always questioning and they're trying to figure out why, right? And it can mm -hmm. seem sort of aggressive, but there's obviously different approaches towards asking questions that are both you know more passive or more polite or more less confrontational. But in the idea of, is it good to question everything? It absolutely is. And if I'm questioning everything, I can't imagine how I could be even more skeptical. It's just at that point, now I have to learn how to format it in a way that, you know, doesn't make me as aggressive or off-putting, but I'm still questioning people, even if I'm being polite about it. Right. And mm -hmm. that's an interesting concept. <clears throat> There's a devil in that detail. <laughs> <laughs> devil in the nuance of it. Joe Sky, I'd love to get your opinion. Do you think that, uh, I'll throw this easier. Uh, do you think Christianity has a problem with people trying to figure out stuff and why? Well, yes, most definitely. Uh, as to the why, uh, I think if you keep the people ignorant that your religion is going to do better. Mm hmm Yeah. Yep. Well put. <clears throat> the more ignorant your followers, the more ardent they are in, your, in their support of you. I, we, we can almost pull that to any sort of you know, relationship. I also find well, that and, then, and that takes it back to last week's topic uh, where we, you know, talking about ignorance being bliss, right? Right. Uh, right. You know, the, the blissful are, are, are followers essentially of, of those who would keep them ignorant. And, yeah. and speaking of previous topics, we had this thing where knowledge is power. And we were talking about how in Catholic circles, there's this idea of a confessional where like a person will give all their deepest secrets to somebody who's still a part of their social network, who's still talking to all these other people. And it's like, when you disclose that much price, personal information to somebody, it's very hard to leave that congregation, right? Yeah. You're not going to just like move to the next place because that right. guy now has collateral on you. And mm -hmm. that's a person at the end of the day. So, you know, uh, it's, it's a really bad situation. And your whole family. Not, yeah, not my family. Larry, I think, I think, we we've been hitting this on the on exactly this nail on the head in that um it then when we find out things it often does not call, fall in line with the dogmatic principles or teachings of any major religion when we figure out new stuff and so as a result it's seen as a challenge against that dogma and so a lot of that dogma tries to fight uh, ahead of time against the efforts or even the interest to try to figure out the matters of the world because that would only cause them to lose power if it was if the results are that it wasn't their God or their principles or their narrative that was responsible for events in the world. And I find like if that's the case, then we should ask skeptics only continue to promote people to try to figure that out and build our awareness on that on those key points. Uh, speaking of awareness, Dread Pirate, I thought you had some interesting concepts going on. Well, you know, and it's funny because, uh, of course, I have brought this up, just ruminating, brought it up about this idea of Jesus units and, and the idea of a Jesus unit being what was available in terms of scientific knowledge or awareness of the world hmm. um, in, 30, in 30 AD. 
And uh, it was funny because I'm reading a book called uh, From Bacteria to Bach and Back huh. by, and um, back. by Daniel Dennett. And, and I just wow. a few days ago, I got to page uh, 113. And there he says, uh, uh, this uh, science fiction writer called Robert Anton Wilson. Oh, uh, yeah. I've never read anything of his, but uh, he proposed the Jesus unit. Oh. And it was defined. <laughs> Wait this. a second. So you're saying great minds think alike? <laughs> or dummies barely differ. I don't no, know. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he says uh, defined as the amount of scientific information known during the lifetime of Jesus. And uh, it was just, I mean, I was just flabbergasted when I read it. And um, so anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought, yeah, what a crazy thing to have happened twice. Dredd, you know, if just... you, Dredd, you, you need to read the Illuminati trilogy, Dredd. Yeah. Robert okay. Anderson, a, a classic in its field. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I love good science fiction. So, do you ever feel like sometimes you life is like stand up comedy where you'll tell a joke and people will be like, that's someone else's joke? And you'll be like, but it's <laughs> it's so easy to just put together. Like, I didn't, well, I, copyright I mean, you it. think I'm about just... you think about uh, Leibniz and uh, Newton coming up with calculus at the same time, or yeah, yeah, or yeah, Wallace, yeah, yeah, or Wallace and Darwin coming up with evolution. I mean, it, it seems sometimes that things are you know, that uh that stuff is kind of percolated to a point where there's time for a paradigm change. Hmm. And all of a sudden, all these people are simultaneously having these great ideas. It's right, right, right. It's actually, it's like, quite remarkable. It's I rock write, and roll, I you know? I, definitely I, I blame the noodly monster, of course. Yeah. <laughs> his tentacles are everywhere. Okay, so let's talk about the Jesus unit. What would you propose? Well, I was just thinking, because um, it's, it's like Moore's Law. Uh, with respect to uh, technology where you know if there's exponential gains um, like uh, transistors mm. are becoming twice as small twice as quickly as the as the former formulation of them right mm. and that it's going on an exponential curve the s decrease in size of a chip say with the with going over time so in half the time a chip is getting twice as small you know, and it's working like a, a log a logarithmic thing. Scale for kindness, yeah. I so I like the idea of a scale that you know increments in units the awareness of the world. However, it was such a disconnected world in like 30 AD, right? And a lot of information of the cultures that we had aren't available to us now. So, and not only that, but just so desperately disconnected that it's sort of like it's a harder thing to capture than compared to today, where it's like, we have a much more globally connected world and a much more better understanding of like, what do we all know, or ha at least have access to as a, as a people? Yes, there's people who are still living as if it was medieval times right now. And, and then there's also people living in space at the same time too. It's, it's a much more grander time, but like we can track that average much more, I would say accurately than we did a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. Sure. And so I find, I like the I, I like the I like the idea of a, a unit to describe awareness. What is the meaning of the unit, and like what are we what are we hoping that a, that unit does over time? Mm. Well, you know, like if it's a Jesus unit, I think it's just kind kind of kind of something to sort of intellectually have fun with, <laughs> um, because you know certainly a Jesus unit. Sorry, that's my dog. I hope he's okay. <laughs> she's got separation anxiety okay um, okay somebody else talk for a minute well I'll sure 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 <laughs> larry the idea of a jesus unit is sort of like hey what did everybody know at this one point in time and my thing or like my my you mean scientifically what did I they mean, know i'm gonna say scientifically let's keep it okay. simple right but my my issue would be um i think in the grand scope of the universe like of what the things that we could learn, right? If, if, you know, humans get their stuff together, like anything that we've learned in the last 2000 years would barely be a blip on the, on the Jesus unit scale as a result. Like to say yeah. that we could advance to like 10 units, four units, 40 units. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, 
50,000 years from now, we might have completely different standards of science. Like we sure. might look at what we're doing now and be like, you guys, we're still doing homeopathy. You are still yeah. like, like, no, 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 this, this is not science. This is but science. Think, and it is as far as science goes, we're doing the best we can. Uh, right. We, we have, we make new discoveries every year. We build on the science so that we've had before. Absolutely. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, right. Because we have the teachings of those who have gone before us. Um, religion would more or less teach us to ignore that and mm. stay with what is put in the book. Right. And, um, you yeah. It would stagnate us or be the like ultra conservative values uh, and hold to them. And that's the weird thing. Science doesn't just get bigger over time. It does as much cleaning out as it does grow. Right. And so 500 years ago, the science that we used to use, a lot of those principles, a lot of those classes or or genres of science, we don't do anymore. So like dowsing for like looking for water, we got rid of that. Uh, yeah. We still have chiropractory, but we got rid of a lot of spiritual healing. Snake oil is now like synonymous with like fake oil. Like that's not supposed to cure you. Like, there's a lot of things that we did back then that if we went back another 500 years, would be like, oh, geez, guys, this isn't science at all. This is just putting leeches on your body and expecting that to get rid of migraines or like connect to the stars by like drinking mercury. And you go back another 500 years past that. It's like you guys are you aren't praying to gods, but you are burning a lot of stuff with the hopes that you know, flies will spontaneously regenerate from like pots and, and, and of oil and stuff like that. So right. no germ theory a thousand years ago. So like, how are you going to claim like, hey, we made the best sewers in the universe. So it's just like, one, you don't know what chlorine is. Two, you haven't made metal. Like you're, so- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not disinfecting you use, anything. You use lead when you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm saying like, if you gave us 500 years from now, would we really look back at the time that we have now and say, here, here are increments? Or would we say, you instead got rid of a lot of stuff? Hopefully, that's what I'm hoping for. Well, and maybe, uh, what do you think, Dred? Well, I was, I was just going to, I mean, science is a self-correcting mechanism, right? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, it, I mean, that's built right into, um, right into the method- methodology of science. And it's a, a sort of a, you know, the Bayesian reasoning, right? Where you build on your priors, uh, you know, new information is not just generated in a vacuum. It's based on your priors so that you're right. correcting for what you formerly knew, mm. you're not just coming up with new theories all the time. Exactly. You're modifying and, uh, and adding uh, or subtracting from the theory you, are, you currently have. So it's not like uh, someone is going to come up tomorrow and some great discovery they found in a cave that's you know around for three million years or mm. 30 million years or whatever and all of a sudden darwinism is turned on its head that's right. never going to happen right 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 uh i mean never never but i i think we have enough evidence right now where it's like we're getting closer to something right and so for us to do a complete trajectory change would have to be like a fundamental change in like the fabric of our universe at least our right. local universe, we might even figure out like in a different part of the universe, physics is completely different with completely different variables, right? And that now will not be a formulaic change to like how we think about subjective science in one place working it compared to how it would work on the other end of the universe. That might be interesting. Anyway, <laughs> musings. Yeah. I love it. Intellectual yeah. musings. Yeah. Larry, go on ahead. Right. Well, it's just in the middle of the show. We need to take a short break and come sure. right back. Uh, Stay tuned for the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter 5, and we're on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's talk for just a moment about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 20th year and have over a thousand members. We have weekly in-person meetings in Knoxville's old city in Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top table, so if it's pretty weather outside on the deck. We also have a Tuesday evening Zoom Zoom Ask Meetup. If you'd like to join us, email us for the link at AS, I'm sorry, ask an atheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or let's chat se at gmail.com. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. 
Don't find one. Don't find start one. one. Start one. Start one. You talk too Word fast, Larry. I can't up. translate. <laughs> so right. you won't pick up. Hey, so we were talking about the Jesus unit, as in measuring our awareness over time. Turns out a lot of people had this idea over time. But Dred, I'm going to give the credit to you because you brought it up for the show. So we'll give it to you. <laughs> but I also thought, what if we did one instead of, it's, what if we based the Jesus unit not on awareness, but on other ambiguous things that are kind of hard to track? And I thought kindness would be an interesting thing. How kind were we back in 30 AD? And now are we more kind or are we less kind? And can we metric that based on many times as or less than the time that we were kind during Jesus's point in time, if he existed well, at all? Larry or Dred, what do you got? Uh, well, one of my favorite, favorite authors is uh, mm -hmm. Steve Pinker. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have heard of him. Um, anyway, he wrote, uh, he's written a couple of uh, really good books, um, Better Angels of Our Nature. Okay. And he actually does a really good job of uh, scouring um, historical records to uh, determine are we whether or not we are getting better as a, as a species in, in terms of how we treat each other, um, the freedoms and rights that we grant, uh, you know, in like, you know, in building equality and, uh, you know, mutual respect and all the rest. And and it seems that we are on a, a, tra a trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, a positive trajectory towards towards that end. It's an easy thing to overlook. It really is, especially in the news, like, you know, recent news or the agenda from my field news agencies to continue to captivate people so they can watch advertisements so that they get you with terrible news, terrible news, terrible news. So you never feel like you can change the channel. You won't believe what happened at 6 p.m. We'll tell yeah. you then. And there's like an explosion shift. And you're just like, oh no, oh, I have to keep watching. Yes. So I, I do feel like we are on a trajectory of being better and kinder and nicer to people. If anything, being more interconnected, which I feel like yeah. is the driving force of the empathy that we are. I have, a, uh, I have a Facebook group called the Humans for a Kinder World. Mm. And when I was doing some research to start this group, did a little math and I found out that there's a quarter of a million people on Facebook belong to various kindness groups. Good. So well, there definitely is progress in that direction. Mm. Larry, what do you think? Well, it reminds me uh, what Judd was saying about uh, it, it's a long arc. Uh, M Martin Luther King said uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Mm. And I, I believe he pretty much got it right. Um, yeah. I mean, the old days were the savage days. You know, getting right. medieval on you uh, was pretty close to the truth. Yep. Uh, nowadays, all of that is seen in a bad light, uh, if not downright illegal. Right. Uh, and we tend to treat each other better these days uh, on average, although there are exceptions everywhere. You know, I, I am reminded when I went to the gym yesterday and I was working on an elliptical trainer and I was looking out the window, there was a swimming pool at our gym. And the most bizarre thing that I know no one else was paying attention to was happening that was kind of blowing my mind. And it was like a small black boy and a really tall white girl, both kids just playing with each other in the same pool with each other. And I know that's like an easy thing to overlook. It's 2022, but like from the, my perspective, that was like a situation where I'm, I'm reminded of pictures from civil rights where it was illegal, one, for black people to even swim in pools like that. It was probably illegal in the pool that we had here. It's a pretty old pool. Mm -hmm. And at like, to give you a frame of reference, 1960 was the time when the first black guy got his PhD at Georgia Tech. Before that, you know, 10 years before that, it was illegal for black people to go to Georgia Tech. So my mom couldn't have gone to the school to get her college education at the place where I eventually got my PhD. And I just see this rapid generational change where it is commonplace for different color kids to play with each other in the South, where there's no problems whatsoever with that being the condition. And I feel like that's just setting us up for like the next advancement, next generation, next generation. Yeah, we like, still have obstacles to overcome like the, these alt-right groups that are coming up now, specifically yeah. uh, Nazism built uh, into it. I'll, I'll make oh dread i feel bad go on ahead talk go yeah ahead. Uh, i was gonna say that uh one notable exception i think is again the rights of women um you know this 
you know, the gay pride, uh, same sex marriage, um, you know, e equality, uh, you know, greater equality for, uh, you know, through Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, attention drawn to uh, these grave injustices over time. And yet the rolling back again, once again, of women's rights, yep. uh, it's, it's egregious in the, in the worst way. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was, I was uh, reluctant to, to, to call myself a feminist because I didn't want to um, be that my entire focus, you know what I mean? But the more I, <laughs> you know, this, this is an occasion where I now call myself a feminist. Sure. Because I think it is such a wrong right. uh, to the rights of women and to the equality of all people in the human species um, to allow this sort of right wing um, blasting of, of rights that were established or had gained some ground uh, 50 years ago and are now being rolled back. It's just it's painful, painful it's to watch. The, it's like the equivalent of having a marathon start. And just before you begin, you give one guy or one of the, the runners, a 10 minute head start and you shoot the other player <laughs> yeah, in the foot. Exactly, you'd right, be like, right. the one who got shot in the foot needs help. It's like, well, we should help everybody. It's like, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold yeah, on. This is not exactly. a fair race. We have to help this person who's bleeding on the court. Yeah. Like, oh, well, you're, you're hollering one person above the other. It's like, yeah, I am. Because that person needs the help right now. And that's how we can make a better race for everybody. Make sure yeah. that person who got shot doesn't get shot in the future or any other players get shot. That's why it makes sense to be a feminist in my head. And that's, yeah. that's, that's where my approach is for it. Like you have to look at which group is clearly being marginalized and affected by like the misogyny that's active and, and actually rampant institutionalized. And yeah. how can we resolve that as effectively as possible? Well, and, and I think, you know, and this came up in, a, in one of our previous shows, either through the Global Atheist News, but, uh, you know, for someone to say, well, I, I can't really speak to it because I don't have a uterus. No, you can speak to it. You can yes. speak to it. Yes. You, know, you know, stand up for, for people, you know, of, uh, you know, suffering injustice. Right. And, uh, you know, take a stand, you know, that's, exactly. that's the point. It means even more in my head. Then, and I'm not saying it means less when people with uterus speak up, but like when the marginalized group speaks up, that's, that's what should happen. Cause if you punch someone, they're going to say, ow. But if you have a person who wasn't getting punched being like, Hey, stop punching that guy. That's hurting that person. That means so much more. Cause now you have someone in the crowd. You have someone you can follow. You have someone in the audience who's empathetic to let you realize one, I'm not as crazy as the people who are attacking you. I'm an ally. And I'm willing to speak up and cause change in the same time too. That's so much more valuable. Right. What's up, Fred? I was going to say also, it's not speaking in the absence of that group. Like, uh, so I'm not going to, in the absence of, say, um, you know, someone talking about Jews or whatever, um, I'm not speaking for them. I'm speaking with them. Correct. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, pretend to speak for a woman. Right. But I would speak with a woman in support of a woman. Right. In the presence of women. Right. Right. So that I'm not. I'm not, I'm not their champion. I'm not a knight in shining armor. Exactly. I'm there to support them. Yeah. Right. Larry, what do you got? Uh, what you were saying about speaking up when some, when you see uh, oppression or aggression, uh, silence supports the aggressor. Yes. Uh, if you, if you say nothing, then he assumes he's in the right and there's, you know, the person he's trouncing on is in the wrong and he's he has every authority to do it unless you question that authority he will continue and the people around him will take it as authority yeah. right not only that but like being afraid to speak up or choosing not to is right. prioritizing the feelings of the the those who would victimize you know the assailants of misogyny or racism right. or bigotry mm -hmm. you're, you're putting Sometimes. their feelings above those who are actual victims of the thing that you that you and also it, are against what are you doing it takes courage it courage does. is not lack of fear it's doing something in the face of fear yeah. you, you sometimes exactly. you need to have courage and exercise that courage that's why we give our some of our highest awards for an act of courage mm. i'll make a i'll make a point that the change that we cause is not permanent and needs to be protected same thing with like, or for example, democracies are very fragile and right, the rights right. that we have are just agreements that we've come to. They aren't necessarily 
like a thing transcendent that's been given to us. It's things that we've come together as a social contract and established and said, these are the rules that we will follow as a society, which means they are very fragile because anybody can come and take them away. And if you right, have right. rights that be taken away, they aren't truly transcendent rights because there aren't a transcendent force given to us, which means it's up to us to protect them. And if we ever fall on that, they can be taken away as they have been for, for women's autonomy. And mm -hmm. I think they can also be given back because we've seen that come back and forth. So the change that we're seeing needs to be protected, needs to be maintained because it's not a passive thing. It's not a thing where it's like, well, they'll figure it out. You have to enact it. And one of the easiest ways to do that in America is by voting. Just as a quick reminder, not a call to action, Larry. Hopefully this isn't it. But early voting is uh -huh. open. Early voting is open, especially in Tennessee. So if you are want to vote, go to your electoral commission. You'll be able to do it immediately. And when does it end? Uh, it ends after mm -hmm. the actual election, which is coming up. Oh, really? You can uh, yeah, yeah, vote yeah. now until you can then? Vote right now, you can go into election commission wow. and vote for your local districts, sheriffs. I didn't know it lasted sort of so thing. long. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah, it's not the uh, final election two years from now, but it's the one where no. you can decide primaries and a bunch of other stuff in your local areas as well and, and yeah. make some knowledgeable choices. Um, the last and, thing and want... that's and thank you, Ty, for saying that what you just said, they're knowledgeable choices. No, I mean, no. just just calling people or just, you know, encouraging people to go out and vote is not enough. Right. People need to know what the issues are. They yes. need to make rational decisions with respect to what those issues are and not just close your eyes and, you know, throw a dart at the, uh, at the ballot box, right? Correct. You, you know, you got to know what you're doing. And in Tennessee, you can use your phone when you go vote. So you can clearly look up the names. You can just Google them. There's typically websites that'll tell you everybody who's on the ballot, what their positions are, what their backgrounds are. And listen, if you are the kind of person that wants to vote red all the way up and down, there's no problem with that. But let me just say this. There are different kind of candidates who are running for a Republican office, and not all of them agree with the things that you agree with. And so you can you can truly fine tune your choices if you're like a straight you know ticket ballot or one color or the other, and choose what I feel to be the best option, and not just necessarily the one that's at the top of the list just because they have Republican or Democrat in front of their name. I was at the uh, booths. Can I talk about? It? I was at the booths. And I was realizing that some options didn't have a uh, independent or democratic option that I could look up. Some of them were just three Republicans. And I, instead of just picking one at random, I was looking him up. And one of them was like straight up, I have 14 kids. I went to a Bible college. I had six degrees from a Bible college. And I believe that church and state shouldn't be separated because when you look back at the, at the time, it only says that Congress shouldn't make a uh, church, shouldn't declare a, a, a state religion or something like that but every state had a religion they were presbyterian they were lutherans they were baptists so when you really think about it we should really have these things combined i'm like this guy is crazy and i do not want to vote for this one crazy republican <laughs> uh, if i'm gonna have to pick between these three i'm gonna at least segue myself into one that i find a bit more moderate in their approach and, and at least you know not pushing us further towards the doom and gloom that we could potentially reach if we don't protect the advancements that we've made through the changes that we have. Again, change doesn't happen without a challenge. And I like Larry's point. You can't challenge something without courage because it's important to speak up and it's important to keep speaking up uh, and make your points uh, be well known and not let that silence take over. Um, it's absolutely imperative that we maintain that as a culture. Uh, man, ninth, it's, it's getting close to the end of the show. Dread, some final thoughts on this. Uh, so you you agree that people are getting more kinder? Is there a unit number that you would place on that? Are we four times <laughs> taller? Four point six uh, high? Well, Do you want to reference your shirt at all? Yeah, we have to have a. So we got to shift it from uh, Jesus units to kindness units. I like it. I yeah, like yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> that's cool. that's definitely got to be the shift there. Let's yeah, uh, can... talk to Robert Anton Wilson and and uh, get him to write a new sci-fi with kindness units instead. Yeah, we need a we need a paragon of kindness. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Joe Sky, could you repeat oh, that? Oh, I was saying, unfortunately, Mr. Wilson is dead. Oh, mm. oh, wow. We got to talk to his kids then. His fourteen yeah. kids. Yeah, he does. He he has kids. <laughs> um, one of one of the girls is a Buddhist. I, oh, there you go. They're, Dredd, they're I'm kind. Gonna, they tend to be kind if they're not radical. Dredd, I'm going to yeah, throw yeah. something out at you because sure. I think it's a little tongue in cheek. But what if instead of Jesus units, we called it bacon units? 
And the reason why I like like bacon units. One, everybody agrees bacon's nice, except (laughs) religious people. (laughs) (laughs) I I suppose Jewish people would not be kind to uh, bacon units. Right, 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 right. And I'm just like, hey, bacon units from Jesus time to now. We could have pasta units. We could have pasta units too. Everyone can eat pasta. Everyone can eat pasta. That's true. That's true. It's true. It's true. Okay. I like it. I like it. Larry, uh, thoughts? Kindness in humanity. We're going up. Challenge. We should protect it. Any other wise sage advice from the man who wears suspenders, even when he's <laughs> in a virtual reality? Um, I can't think of anything right offhand, but I'm, I can come back to it. We need a drawstring on the back of you that we could just pull and you can just give us some nice <laughs> subtle <laughs> that sound like oh, okay well, it's nice. just hard to come right out of the middle out of the you know <laughs> air uh, i need a topic you know ask me about a particular things and i can probably come back to you okay but fair enough just fair give enough. me some advice it's not uh, it's not bad brush your teeth every day <laughs> brush your teeth every day hey that's not bad dread i was gonna say that uh you know going back to the rights of women mm. is that in order to really make that solid, uh, because Roe versus Wade was actually a pretty weak um, uh, uh, foundation for women's rights, uh, is that it has to be enshrined as an amendment to the Constitution Hmm. that is guaranteed uh, as part of the Constitution and not as something that the Supreme Court can just overturn uh, based on um, their affiliation with uh, uh, religion or politics well the supreme court is the newest arm of the republican party but also realize that the supreme court nine justices if i recall correctly six of them on the conservative side so truly three people are the ones that are making these decisions in a sense pushing them down and 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 so it's not a reflection of american culture that three people decided that they don't like something and and because of that we don't have to accept it for, for what it is. So if there are protests, support the protests. If there are, you know, this distastement for it, remember why you were distasted from it and don't just swallow it up for the next election cycle. Make yourself, make your voice heard and, mm-hmm. and speak to the culture of wanting that change because that has power. And it's only when you give it up that the, the, the nefarious sides of things win. Uh, so hope is hard. Hope is hard. So is living in a world that you don't want to be in right? You, so is living in a world that's falling out of control. You can choose your heart, right? You can choose to make a change. Pick your heart. Pick your heart is what I'm saying. Uh, okay, that's about it for me. Larry, we're going to go through plugging. Joe Sky, do you have anything that you'd like to plug? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, okay. I have a Facebook page called the Nullifidian Chronicles. It's uh, not always about atheism and religion. Uh, right now, it's kind of political. Uh, I also have the Facebook group Humans for a Kinder World. Uh, and we're very active in the kindness movement. Nice. Okay. Cool. Dread? Anything yeah. Else? Well, uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, uh, Mind Pirate, M I N D P Y R A T E. I live stream this at 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on Mm. Sunday mornings and uh, also on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I stream the Global Atheist News Review through Free Thought uh, Productions. So if you like, subscribe and come check me out. Anything and any random one, one, give us that title for the book again, if you have it nearby you. Oh, uh, are you talking about the, the Daniel? Bacteria Dan- to Bach. Bach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Bacteria to Bach and back. Nice. It's the evolution of minds. It's a nice. fascinating read. Daniel Dennett is such an amazing author. He's a philosopher um, who's been working in this field for of minds and consciousness for, you know, his almost his entire career. And he's had a long and illustrious career. So check cool. him out. I will tell you this. I have rewatched Contact the movie. Okay. Ah, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> yeah. And As regret, I, I mean, I don't, cool. all the problems I had with it make me feel like I didn't watch the movie the first time 
properly because <laughs> I was just like, well, it's got this. And then it did the thing. I'm just like, oh, okay, well, uh, that's pretty good. And I was like, oh, that's kind of clever. And I was like, ah, oh, there's pretty good representation here too. Okay, fine, fine, <laughs> fine. But you know what else also kind of bothers me? And also like everything that was like, it was written by like a woman and it was like promoted by like a science head. I'm just like, okay, I can't find the, the grips that I was holding on to. So I'm willing to let it go. But the problem, hey, no, the other problem that I have with the movie is like uh, how frustrated I am that there's just not closure to the movie. Mm-hmm. And that sort of alludes yeah. to like, it's not a scientific result. It's more of just like more open questions that could hopefully be approached. I also don't like this too. I also say this too. Here's my last thing. The, the alien who's like, thanks for coming here. And I know a bunch of people died as you try to get here, but you're not ready for us to come here. It's like, you could have sent us a text message then. Because you really <laughs> spent trillions what? and trillions yeah. of dollars trying to get here twice. That's so funny. just text us next time if we're not ready and let us know. Because yeah. we, we had people dying trying to get up here, man. You're wasting our time. It messes me up. It messes me up. I hate it if an alien told me that. I'd be like, oh, well, watch out. We're coming for you now. Yeah. That's how you yeah. make enemies. That's how you make yeah, enemies. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, I'm let's chat on YouTube. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject of atheism. My YouTube channel can be searched and found by searching for Doubter5 or digitalfreethought.com. Uh, you can find my book, Atheism, What's It All About, on Amazon. And you can find the Atheist Society of Knoxville at knoxvilleatheist.org or just by Googling Knoxville Atheist. If you have questions for the show, you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or letschatse at gmail.com. Uh, you can find this show on Apple iTunes, Pocket Cast, Amazon, Pocket Cats everywhere. Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we'll see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 B